Want to see how I would design a warship? Grab your copies of both Space Dock reference books about fighters and frigates on our Patreon through the link in the description or pinned comment below. Hello everybody and welcome back to Space Dock. I'm Hujiwana and recently we've been covering ship classes in various contexts and today it's the turn of the Dreadnought. These ships are a sci-fi staple that often has no relation to the real world origins of the term, the 1906 Royal Navy battleship HMS Dreadnought. Before the launch of this vessel, battleships were equipped with a wide variety of guns so that they could engage any and all targets. HMS Dreadnought did away with that, focusing entirely on carrying as many big guns as it possibly could. Combined with the technological improvement found in its steam turbine engines, it could outgun and outmaneuver any opponent. To use a gaming term, it changed the meta by rendering previous battleships kinda obsolete. Sci-fi often doesn't do that. In sci-fi, a dreadnought tends to be, but isn't always, a step up from a battleship in size and power, like how battleships are a step up from cruisers. There were super dreadnoughts in real life that were larger and had bigger guns, but they were still just battleships. Why does sci-fi do it differently? Probably Star Wars with the Super Star Destroyer setting a trend, and then popular sci-fi's insistence on following it, constantly expanding the size of ships in a setting in an arms race of ridiculousness, but that's a rant from a previous video. Back to Star Wars, which while being the origin of oversized ships, did do a decent job of applying the word Dreadnought to a wide variety of things across the old expanded universe. There's all sorts of odd things in the comics that use the term, as well as the fan favourite Dreadnought class cruiser, which uses the alternate spelling and is a fairly small ship by old Imperial standards. But there was also the classification of Star Dreadnought that appeared, assigned to the Executor and all similar big boy triangles like the Bellator and Eclipse, as well as Grievous's favourite ship. More recently, the sequel trilogy very deliberately followed the bigger than a battleship definition for the Mandator 4 at Rian Johnson's request, along with giving it a big gun and broadly following World War II battleship design elements. So this is sort of a both worlds vibe going on, mixed into one ship. As for the Mega class, well that was a mobile colony more than anything else. Do you think it should count? Star Trek, while having lots of large ships, rarely calls them Dreadnoughts. In fact, there's only three across the whole franchise, at least in Alpha Canon. The first one was just text on a monitor in Star Trek 3, referring to an under-construction Dreadnought that happened to line up with a picture of a Constitution. Canon eventually circled back around to the ship, and it showed up in Picard Season 3 as a model, with its technical manual-derived appearance. The next Dreadnought showed up in Voyager in an episode centred around it, but that one was an oversized and heavily armed Cardassian missile that Balana had nicknamed when she was in the Maquis, after its unstoppable nature. Going for the actual meaning of the word there. The third and most recent one is the most tropey, to the point where it's literally the example on the TV tropes page, the Dreadnought class USS Vengeance from Into Darkness. It's huge, it's over the top and very heavily armed, and is way out of the usual Starfleet style of ships. It's interesting that the mainline media in both Star franchises kind of avoided directly inciting this trope until relatively recently in their long histories, despite both having many large and powerful vessels that could otherwise fit the term. Another franchise with huge ships that doesn't use the term is Battlestar Galactica, because, well, it has its own terms. Both factions have their own unique vessels, the Battlestars and the Base Stars, both of which have a decent complement of fighters as well as being able to engage directly in combat. In their own way, in an in-universe and also meta-genre one, BSG is kinda similar to the real HMS Dreadnought in that these vessels ended up setting a meta. Another, even larger legacy setting that doesn't use the term is Warhammer 40,000, because Dreadnoughts there are Astartes walkers. Yes, there's big ships in space, but they're generally explicitly classified as battleships or something along those lines. It's pretty cool, honestly. The walkers completely stopped the word Dreadnought having any association with spaceships. It's notable for its absence. Now, three settings that do use the term, but subvert things by having them be outclassed in some manner. EVE Online, Farscape, and Babylon 5. EVE Online introduced the class as being used for sieging player-owned space stations and other structures. These days, I know you can build them out for engaging smaller ships and such, but I'm no EVE expert. I know they had big guns. 
Yes, they're also a tier up in size from battleships, and we're also the first of the capital ships, I think, but they're actually on the small end of capitals. They were outsized by supercarriers and titans, the latter of which ended up occupying the tropey territory of sci-fi dreadnought. Farscape's Scarron Dreadnoughts are one of the bigger ships in the whole setting, bigger than the Peacekeeper command carriers that were introduced much earlier. But the Peacekeeper vessels are actually more powerful than their larger Scarron opponents, so that's interesting that a Dreadnought ends up weaker in combat than something referred to as a carrier. Babylon 5's Earth Force Dreadnoughts appropriately wielded only big guns, but ended up being replaced by a destroyer? Well, one that carried loads of missiles and fighters, so we have some neat real-world developmental parallels here. Mass Effect took a lot of inspiration from Babylon 5, but notably it did something very different with Dreadnoughts. Here, they are the keystone feature of the various navies in the setting, and while yes there's workhorse ships like cruisers and frigates around, the Dreads are the biggest and baddest. Battles are defined by the long-range firepower that they carry. They're so powerful that the ruling citadel races limited how many everyone can build with the Treaty of Phyrixen, naturally keeping the majority to themselves. This is based on the real-life Washington Naval Treaty from the interwar period, right down to setting ratios between nation-states for how many big ships they can build. This, along with the power of Dreadnought, is one of the reasons for it being a big deal when non-council races start producing their own, like the Quarian and Geth arms race that leads into war in the third game. In fact, the Geth one became the whole focal point for the battle and the player's actions in that section of the game. We're going to round things out with Star Sector's Invictus, because oh my god this ship! This ridiculous brick but not a brick. This solid lump of armour with only big guns. It's been living rent free in my head for ages, I find it endlessly fascinating. First of all, it's decently close to the original use of the term Dreadnought, as it's a battleship with all big guns, even the ones covering its engines. But it is slow, and it can also be fitted out with some missiles or even a small air wing. Its main draw is its forward fixed battery, which has its range and effectiveness dramatically boosted when its ship system, a LiDAR targeting array, is activated. This gives it huge burst damage potential and pushes it to being one of the longest range ships in the entire game, very fitting of what Dreadnoughts actually were. But what intrigues me so is that the Invictus is a massively outdated ship. It's so old it predates every other capital in the game, to the point where its design comes from a museum. To that end, it has no shields, instead relying on its hilariously thick armour to survive, along with a bit of BSG style flak. It also has an absurd minimum crew requirement of 4,000, with a max of 6,000. With that many people you can crew many other capitals, or entire fleets. I love it, this puts an interesting logistics trade-off onto the ship that also implies how outdated and basic and manual it is, since you gotta hire and pay all those people. Unless you're the Ludic Church, who can fill it with eager volunteers. That is the sort of thing Dreadnoughts should be in my mind. Mass Effect and Star Sector both treat them as being something special without going too far down the tropey route, albeit in very different ways. One has them remain as the big stuff, but uses plenty of real world inspiration for all the ancillary details surrounding them. The other treats it as a deeply flawed look into the past, a time before the crazy tech that changed how space combat was fought and how ships were built. Both routes are deeply characterful and deeply interesting. They're way better than the throwaway and now generic ships that you think of when you see the word Dreadnought in a sci-fi context. You can support Space Dock by joining our Patreon where you can get our frigate and space fighter design reference books. Alternatively, you can support us directly through YouTube by becoming a channel member. Thanks to our supporters and thank you for watching.